All right, this thing's on. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming out for my talk this morning. Uh, I know it's still pretty early on the last day of the conference. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about defeating the pragmatic adversary, and I'll explain what that is in just a moment. Um, before I get started, um, I'm Ryan Olson. I'm the director of threat intelligence for Palo Alto Networks, which basically means I run Unit 42, um, which you might have heard of. Um, but I wanted to quickly give you an introduction to what the mission of our team is before I get started actually talking about the pragmatic adversary. Um, this is it. I don't know why we're going back and forth. There we go. Um, this is the mission of the team, to analyze the data that's available to Palo Alto Networks to better understand adversaries, their motivations, resources, and tactics, uh, to better understand the, the threats that our customers face. So those three sort of things there, resources, tactics, and motivations, that's what we're generally trying to identify in relation to that adversary, that guy sitting there in the middle. So today I'm going to be talking a lot about what that adversary is um, and sort of how he operates. And I think the security community uh, and definitely the media has done sort of a poor job representing who that adversary is. Um, sometimes we think of them as sort of death robots just continually trying to attack our networks and ruin our weekends and make everybody's life hard. But that is not the adversary you're actually dealing with. Sometimes we think of them as these shady characters who are faceless and see in code and they are sort of an unstoppable force. That is also not your adversary. This is your adversary. He's a guy. He's got a wife. He's got a kid. He's got a dog. And most importantly, he has a boss. And I like to think of this guy as the pragmatic adversary. And this is the concept that I want to introduce to you today to sort of take a step back from thinking about bad guys in a certain way and think about them as pr pragmatic individuals instead. The definition of pragmatic really quickly up here, dealing with things sensibly and in a realistic way that is based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. It's important to remember that the person on the other side of the keyboard who's attacking you, and there is a person that who created whatever it is that you are dealing with on your Friday night is pragmatic. They want to get into your network, get the job done, and get out undetected. That's what their job is. And they're not going to try simply to create fanciful ways of doing this just because they want to. They are trying to actually accomplish their task, and they're going to use the things that are available to them to accomplish that task, which means they repeat themselves, they reuse tools, they reuse infrastructure, and they definitely reuse tactics over and over again. So today, what I really want to go through is how does that pragmatic adversary operate? Quickly before I go into this, instead of calling him TPA, because I feel like he should have a human name, this is now Bob. So Bob is now the one who is attacking you, and he is our pragmatic adversary. If you've seen a kill chain before, uh, this is one example of them. We call this one the cyber attack life cycle. The reason I'm putting this up is I'm going to walk through each of these six phases of our cyber attack life cycle. Reconnaissance, where we're trying to identify who our attack, or who, when Bob is trying to identify who he wants to attack and how he's going to attack them. Weaponization and delivery, when he's actually trying to deliver um, whatever his payload is into your network. Exploitation, where he takes advantage of something, some vulnerability inside your network could be a human, uh, to actually get into the network. Installation, where he deploys some tools to accomplish whatever his task is. The command and control phase, where he actually interacts with those tools and hides sort of his um, network traffic. And finally, the most fun part of every kill chain, actions on objectives, where he does everything that you actually care about, moving around inside your network, taking your data. We're going to go through each stage of this cyber attack lifecycle from the perspective of Bob, the pragmatic adversary. So let's jump right into this. When, you th when you're thinking about this today as we go through it, Bob is going to be over here on the left, and he's always going to be thinking about how am I going to achieve my goals. You guys in the audience, I want you guys to think about this from your perspective as well. You, every one of you, are an expert in your network. You know your networks better than Bob does, and that's important for you to understand. So as Bob is looking at how to attack his target, I want you guys to think about how would you do that phase of the attack lifecycle in a pragmatic way. Not thinking about it from the perspective of what kind of supercomputer does the NSA have that they can attack my, my organization. Think about it as that it was you, the person who knows your network, the person who sort of knows what's going on in it. And then lastly, think about how you would stop yourself as you were trying to compromise your own network. 
Think about what position you would be in, what you have available, what you would deploy in sort of each of these cases. So let's jump in with rec reconnaissance first. In this case, Bob is thinking, who should I target? So he's trying to identify targets because his boss has told him you need to go and acquire certain information. One of the really simple ways that a pragmatic adversary might do this is through Google. If you Google for file type XLS, Excel spreadsheets, and in URL, so the URL has attendees in it, you get a lot of amazing information. Just one really quick example. Here's a giant spreadsheet filled with people's names, their titles, their phone numbers, their email addresses, all potential fodder for, the, who are attendees at a conference, this was a government conference in this case, all potential fodder for future spear phishing attacks. Really easy for a pragmatic adversary to go and get information to identify who they want to attack. It doesn't require any sophisticated skills to say, I need to get enough information to launch a successful spearfish. Also with reconnaissance, Bob is thinking, who do, what do I need to evade? What do they have in their network that's going to stop me from being successful? This right here is a job posting for an organization who is trying to hire people to work inside their network. And they list here what kind of routers they use, what kind of switches they use, um, what kind of VPN they use. And they really have to do this. There isn't a lot of, if you want to recruit the right people, you might need to post this kind of information just to list skills. But that's really useful to Bob. Bob now knows what kind of VPN you're using. If he wants to send a spear phishing email that looks like it came from your VPN, he's got enough information to do that, just from one job posting. And I'm not saying don't post job postings that contain details. That's something we almost always have to do. But think about the fact that the attacker can easily get this information. There's no secret to what VPN you guys are using. There's no secret to what technologies you're deploying. LinkedIn is also great at this. I really had to redact this one, unfortunately. I used to have a better one, but it got out of date over time. LinkedIn is filled with people talking about what cer certifications they have, what kind of projects that they've been successful at, certainly listing what kind of technologies they use. And a lot of that becomes public to Bob. Bob can go and find out. If he just wants to look at a company, find their security people, find out what kind of technology they use, it's public and it's easy to get to. And same thing with the job posting. I'm not saying tell all your users never post anything on LinkedIn, because you won't be successful at that. Just be aware that nothing that you're doing that's out there is a secret. Jumping into our next phase, weaponization and delivery. How am I going to get to the network? That's what Bob is thinking now. And there's three primary ways that attackers are getting in the network. And I'm, uh, I'm categorizing in, in this way. Spear phishing, attackers who have a specific target, they send an email, and that email carries some sort of malicious content, whatever it might be, to either a specific individual or a group of individuals because they want their, those specific people's data. A watering hole, uh, also known as a strategic web compromise, where you compromise a specific website, and then the people who come to it uh, are then compromised themselves. I'll walk through an example of that in a second. And then a category I call everything else. And the reason I lump everything else over here is these first two are really, really common. These are the things that pragmatic adversary is going to go to first. Before he loads up malware on a USB drive and goes to your parking lot and drops it out there, like a pen tester is going to in a lot of cases, the pragmatic adversary is going to start with these other things, because these are the tools that generally work for him and don't require him to have to get in his car or airplane. So spear phishing, one common spear phishing tactic that we've seen um, a lot, especially in the last 12 months, uh, nearly every espionage-related report that Unit 42 has written has involved this technique in one way or another. It's what I call a spear phishing with a decoy. And I'll describe how this works really briefly. We've got our attacker, our pragmatic adversary, and we have a target. He's going to send an email. All of you know how email works. You know what spear phishing is. And that email is going to have a malicious attachment on it. The attachment is going to have content, it's going to appear very relevant to the user. So the name of the file is very relevant to them. The content of the email itself is descriptive in a way that is to encourage them to actually open it. But the file is actually malicious, and when they open it, it's going to exploit a vulnerability in their system. Generally, office vulnerability, that's typically what we see in spear phishing emails. At that moment, it's going to install a backdoor Trojan, a specific one that that actor uses onto the computer, and that's going to give the attacker access to their network. This is where the decoy comes in, though. At the moment that the backdoor is written to the system, it also writes a decoy document to the system. So if I was expecting to get an Office document that had certain content in it, and I'm the victim, and I open that up, and Word crashes, I'm probably going to be a little bit suspicious. Even the sort of most rudimentary user is going to go, that was annoying. They didn't get to see the content they were expecting to see. They might report that to IT. That might be investigated. 
The decoy document is specifically used to trick users into thinking nothing has actually gone wrong. So when I open up an exploit document that writes that backdoor Trojan, it exploits Word, let's say. Word crashes, that's what happens generally when the, the, the vulnerability is exploited. Word disappears, and then instantly the backdoor is written, the decoy is written, and Word opens up again that contains that decoy document and displays it to them. Now, to the user's perspective, Word has disappeared and reopened, which, quite frankly, is not that weird for Word to sort of just have a hiccup. So no one's going to be like, that was really strange. I'll report that IIT. And the content of that decoy document is actually relevant to them. It's what they were expecting to see. So they're not going to be quite as suspicious. They're not going to connect the, the dots and say, oh, I was just compromised. We've seen a lot of really interesting decoys. Um, Here's a few of them that I wanted to show that are all related to a report that we wrote last year that we called Operation Lotus Blossom. This is the first one. Um, this was a requisition for what was referred to as a mouthpiece loud hailer uh, that was sent from one person in the Philippines Navy to another, at least that's how it appeared. Uh, mouthpiece loud hailer, by the way, took us a while to figure this out, bullhorn, bullhorn. That is what the requisition was for. This was a decoy document on a file that we actually pulled. One that we didn't get from one of our customers, but we got from another source. Based off the content of this, though, we had a very good idea of who was being targeted. It's really unlikely that anyone outside the Philippines Navy was expecting to get a requisition for a bullhorn from somebody else inside the Philippines Navy, especially in this form. Another one we saw in the same attack campaign, this was an invitation to a special screening of the Norwegian movie Kantiki at the Vietnamese, excuse me, at the Norwegian Embassy in Hanoi. Really small population of people who are likely to be interested in or expecting to receive this specific invitation. I was actually talking to a group of executives like two weeks ago, and he was like, one guy stood up and said, I got that. And I said, don't worry, this was like a year ago. You're, he's like, I got that like a year ago. And we, we had a bigger discussion after that. Um, first time that's happened, just once. Last decoy, um, and we had about 50 decoys in the Lotus Blossom report. Um, this one was... Vietnamese language installation guide for LogFusion Pro. Um, this is not something that just anyone's going to install. This is certainly a system administrator and one who is expecting to read a guide um, in Vietnamese. So once again, pretty specific targeting. Decoys, um, I expect every time, Josh and Rob, these guys are on my team. They, they work for me. They write a lot of the fun stuff that we publish. And anytime they come to me and they say, hey, we've got a new targeted attack, I've no longer started saying, does it have a decoy? I just say, what was the decoy? Because that's what I'm expecting to see. They become really common. The watering hole is the other example that I wanted to describe from a targeting perspective. With the spear phishing attack, you know who your target is. I'm trying to target an individual because I already have their email address. Maybe it's a company and I'm emailing a couple people in that company. But with a watering hole, you're targeting a group of people who have a certain kind of interest. So in this example, we've got our pragmatic adversary in the middle, and we've got, uh, this was actually a real example we had from last year, um, the website of a company who services, or who makes big jet engines, okay? They've got a website, they have a service portal for that website, and our attacker has found a way of compromising that website. And what he's done is he's injected malicious code into it JavaScript code, additional code as well, so that when the user visits a page, this specific website, the one that they would go to log into to you know, get service information for their giant jet engines, it's actually gonna uh, exploit a vulnerability in their browser. This was a flash vulnerability. It was actually the hacking team vulnerability, if you guys are familiar with one of those flash vulns. When the user clicks on that page, just because they're going to do their job, it's going to infect their system with the attacker's malware. And now the attacker has control back over their computer and they can get access to their data. Watering holes, much, much more challenging for an attacker to pull off. Uh, it requires a lot more effort in actually finding a good watering hole to compromise. Occasionally, that's an opportunistic thing. You found a site, and you're just going to get all of their users. Um, but it's certainly a tactic that we've seen over and over again. Let's move on to our next phase. So Bob's now thinking, OK, how am I going to get into the network? We talked a little bit about spear phishing and with watering holes that Technical vulnerabilities might be being exploited, vulnerabilities in software. But in a lot of cases, it's a lot easier just to exploit the user. It's unfortunate in 2016 that phishing remains as effective and popular as it is, just straight up phishing. Um, but social engineering is pretty effective. If I know that you use Outlook Web Access, and I send an email that looks like an Outlook Web Access form saying that your password has expired, users get those all the time. 
And the pragmatic adversary knows this, and they can rely on that to just try and fish credentials. If you don't have any form of two-factor authentication um, or other sort of additional authentication mechanisms that might prevent them from logging in, they can now get to that user's email. And they might also know what your VPN is, and maybe they can log in that way. So pragmatic adversary, absolutely. First thing they're gonna do is use some sort of straight up spear phishing, maybe without any kind of technical exploitation at all, because it works. But next, they might choose to exploit your software as well. And we certainly see this in a tremendous number of cases. So in this case, Bob has got lots of vulnerabilities available to him. If you want exploit code for old vulns, it's available all over. You can get tools that build it, it's really, really simple to do. But maybe he's really sophisticated and he's got a zero day that's sitting in his back pocket. So maybe he might choose to use that against your network. The vast majority of cases, no, he's not going to, because he's pragmatic. He's only gonna use his O-Day when he absolutely has to. And when he absolutely has to, that means you've got everything patched. So if you have everything patched, you're in good shape and pat yourself on the back. But if you don't, the two most common exploits that we've seen in targeted attacks over email, especially spear phishing, 2012-0158, office vulnerability, 2010-33-33, both office vulnerabilities. 2010-2012, these are old. We're seeing these used every day in 2016. Unfortunately, it still works. So what I would say is, if an attacker does use a zero day against you and got into your network, be really, really proud, pat yourself on the back. You did a good job because you made his job so hard that he burned his really valuable resource on you, and then you should probably get traps. Someone added a TM to my slide. <laughs> Marketing. Anyway, trap. Traps works again, so it is. It's, it's effective. Go talk to the booth people. All right, next up. So now our attacker's choosing, um, they've got a way into your network, exploiting a person, exploiting a software vulnerability, but they gotta pick tools they're gonna use. When I say tools, you're probably thinking, what do you mean tools? I mean malware, but I think of them as tools, and so does Bob. Bob thinks of them as the thing he's going to use to get his job done. And he's gotta pick tools, he's got a lot of options, but they generally fall into two big categories. One, Bob can create his own tools. Bob might either be a software developer or he might have a developer who's accessible to him as part of his organization. And Bob can roll his own. He can make his own malware, his own backdoor, um, which has a few advantages and it has some disadvantages. Brand new malware, no one's ever seen it before, low detection rate. Most antivirus, zero antivirus engines are gonna detect new malware that's never been seen before, especially if it doesn't do a lot of crazy things. Bob also can access all those antivirus engines to test them if he wants to check. So Bob can determine he has a very, he has a new backdoor, very low detection rate. He also has a lot of control over it. He can control how its command and control channel works. He can give it new features. Um, he can give it very, he can make it very small if he wants to. Um, it can be modular, so he can add new features over time. A lot of control with rolling your own malware. But it's also very expensive. And I don't necessarily mean in money, but definitely in time. It takes a lot more resources to build your own malware, especially if you're building something more complicated, so that it needs a lot of features, than to just pull one off the shelf, which is our other alternative. There are tons of malicious tools available to attackers um, who want to infect networks. And these are just off the shelf tools. The key elements, though, with off the shelf tools is they might have a lot of great features, um, but you can't really add them yourself. Um, you're gonna be buying something that's gonna have the features that you expect. They might have, the piece, people you buy for might have great service. They might add new features for you. That's certainly an aspect of the underground community. Uh, but generally, you're getting what you paid for. You need to pack or encrypt the binaries themselves so they don't get detected by antivirus because if you take a brand new poison ivy, let's say, you just compile it straight up, uh, much more likely that's gonna get detected because there's hundreds and thousands of, of variant separate files of poison ivy. We've had a lot of opportunity to look at those. But you can pack and encrypt them to ensure that AV doesn't detect them and do the same sort of testing. But fortunately, they are very cheap, and in some cases, free. You might be able to get a copy for free, uh, or you might pay someone a few hundred dollars to get access to a good remote access Trojan. So if Bob is gonna go in either of these cases, he has to think about what features do I need in my Trojan? What do I need to do once I'm inside the network? And I'll tell you with the simple Trojans, the rolled your own, um, a lot coming out of espionage groups, they're really simple. They don't have a lot of features. They allow command line access, so you can run a shell, you can upload a file, you can execute that file, you have command line access, and you can download files. Those three things are enough to make a good backdoor, especially if the command and control channel is pretty effective. But if you do wanna go out on the market, there are some great Trojans out there. 
This is a picture of the interface, the control panel for Poison Ivy, the one that I mentioned a little while ago, which is really, really commonly used and easy to get to. Just a couple things to call out. This is a remote shell, so it has that feature that's available to it, but it has lots of other stuff listed here. Um, key logger, audio capture, screen capture, webcam capture, all great features of, of a remote access tool. Um, and these are easy to get, and this is uh, really sort of those trade-offs are, this is a really, really functional rat, a really, really functional backdoor, um, but much, much easier to detect um, for anyone in the security community. So if you wanna go and get something like Poison Ivy, where can Bob find it? How does he actually go and get this? What's he need to know? Unfortunately, it's really, really easy, unfortunately for us. Fortunately for Bob, though. If you wanna get Cybergate, Cybergate is a nice rat. This used to be sold commercially. I think they've actually shut that down now. But if you wanna find it, if you Google for Cybergate, these are your Google suggestions. Download, Cybergate rat download, Cybergate cracked because Cybergate had DRM on it, and then specific versions as well. That's pretty easy. Although I would say if any of you are considering turning to the dark side, don't, don't do this. This is a bad idea. You're gonna get owned yourself. You download any rat that you found in Google on the first three pages, it's probably compromised itself. You're gonna install it and get yourself infected. Different opportunity is go and buy them. There's lots of underground forums out there where things are for sale. This is one example uh, from a specific forum where people are discussing buying different kinds of tools, discussing which tools work better, which tactics they have used in their attacks in the past, although rarely discussing who they actually compromised, just sort of saying this works better or it doesn't. A lot of really unsophisticated actors in these groups, but certainly those who are building the tools who know a lot more. Here's another quick example. People selling remote access tools like Poison Ivy, selling cryptors to actually encrypt the, the files so that they're not going to be, or pack them so that they're not gonna be detectable by malware. And exploit kits as well that will exploit lots of different vulnerabilities in, through your browser, depending on um, which website you click. So at this point, Bob's got all the information, everything that he needs for installation. Uh, it's pretty easy for him to do that, and it does differ between that custom and off the shelf, um, those two realms, based off how sophisticated he is and what kind of infrastructure he has behind him. But the next thing Bob needs to do, and this is a component of choosing what tools he's using, is how is he gonna maintain access to the network and evade detection? Because this is what our networks look like, in some cases. We've got a whole bunch of devices potentially infected. At some point, they're gonna pass through some security device like ours or somebody else's on their way out to a command and control server. That command and control server can be anywhere on Earth. It can be running, it can be a web server, it can be a Windows machine. In the case of Poison Ivy, it's probably a Windows machine. Um, it can be really anything. But between those two endpoints, they've gotta pass that network traffic. And they've got a couple different options as far as how to do it. But the, the, the fancy ones that you hear about, peer-to-peer -peer botnets, crazy sort of um, protocols being passed over DNS, they happen for sure, but that's not where Bob's gonna go first. Bob's gonna go to a couple things. First, he's gonna go HTTP or HTTPS. These are great command and control channels because they pass through most devices, uh, especially stateful, um, stateful inspection firewalls, very easy to pass through if port 80 outbound is allowed, 443 as well. HTTPS is great because it's all encrypted, makes it a lot harder to actually analyze that traffic. HTTP um, malware is absolutely the most common, it's the most common command and control channel we see across all malware. Espionage related malware, cybercrime, all sorts of stuff. Um, and if an advanced adversary, the guy who's actually rolling his custom tool, um, can choose his own command and control channel, there's a very high likelihood he's gonna go with HTTP because he knows that it's gonna fly low, uh, it's gonna be under the radar, it's gonna be harder to detect. Tor and I2P, we've seen this a lot uh, in cases, especially with ransomware, where some level of the command and control channel happens over one of these anonymizing networks. So I wanted to mention that one specifically because it has been happening a lot. Underneath that, it's generally HTTP, just because it works well. And then custom protocols. While they certainly exist, as I said, and they're used by different kinds of attackers, they're not what our pragmatic adversary is gonna go for first. Once he's inside the network, he's gonna rely on your network and he's gonna try to do that as soon as he can. Because he doesn't wanna rely on his command and control channel not being detected forever. Because he knows that we're trying to find that. We're trying to look for it. So if instead, he can swap over to what you use to get into your network remotely, over your VPN, over some sort of remote access, RDP, SSH, whatever it is, if he can identify that and get credentials for it, he'll just move over to that and use it instead. That doesn't mean he's only gonna use that though. So the next question that Bob is gonna ask is, how do I maintain access to this network? 
How do I ensure that if my, the host that I've infected gets wiped, I no longer have access to that specific host, how do I ensure that I still have access into the network? And there's a few different tactics that he's gonna deploy at this point. The first category I would say is elevate and expand access. He's gonna start dumping password hashes from the system they actually compromised. He might start a key logger that's available in his RAT so that he can actually get the login and password for the user on that actual host. Um, dumping hashes, he might get a whole bunch of different users on that host. And ideally, an admin has logged in that host recently and he's able to dump their credentials as well. And then use them to get higher level access inside the network. Because if I get admin access, not for that host, but for the active directory, for that network, I can now do a lot of new things I couldn't do before. Bob can do a lot of things that Bob couldn't do before. If he wants to go and create a new user account just for him, maybe it looks like a service account that he can use for logging into the network, he could do that. Or he can just get addition, he can reset people's credentials, accounts that haven't been used very often. He can certainly get a lot more access than he had before. And like I said in the last slide, he's gonna use his VPN if he can, because he wants to look like a legitimate user coming in. And there are lots of ways to detect potentially malicious activity coming in over your VPN. People coming from places they shouldn't be coming from. Um, you might be able to identify those. And ideally, two-factor authentication is great for, for VPNs because stolen credentials are a bad thing in general. The next category that I want to mention is lateral movement. Once he's inside the network, he's also going to try to get to other hosts. And we talk a lot about detecting malware moving in different places in the network, but after the pragmatic adversary is inside your network and he infected one host with a piece of malware, it's possible that he's gonna say, okay, let me infect five others with my backdoor because I wanna maintain my access to those systems. I don't wanna rely just on your credentials. But he's also gonna be trying to do that without his malware because it's not, uh, moving malware between hosts is another great way to get infected. It's much easier or get detected. Much easier to just use those credentials that you've stolen to remotely access other systems through PowerShell scripts, great for launching remote um, commands on other hosts, uh, WMI, the Windows Management Interface, lots of cool things that you can do with WMI for launching execution on other hosts as well as gathering information from them. Um, like I said in the last slide, RDP, SSH, whatever remote access you use, you guys are the admins. If you think about your network, how would somebody move from one host to another inside your network? might as well use the same thing, because you're gonna blend in with the rest of the, the, that traffic. Uh, the at scheduling system also used to be really common. I'm not sure if it's, if it's maintained its commonality since it became so um, sort of well known. But the key for Bob is never rely on a single host. If he's infected a network and he's got one host, he really has to get another foothold in that network to ensure that he can maintain that and doesn't get kicked out tomorrow, because that's the last thing he wants after he did all that work to actually get inside the network. All right, next question. In this case, we're assuming that Bob is an adversary who's trying to exfiltrate some data, because that's pretty common. Um, at this point, we're in our actions on objective phase. We were in the last one as well, so we're here in the sort of the last phase of the cyber attack life cycle. We wanna know how are we gonna get our data out after we've actually found it. Depends a lot on the data that you're trying to exfiltrate and on the network itself. So Bob's gonna be pragmatic about this. He knows what the network looks like. He doesn't wanna get detected. One first option for him, like I said, nearly every rat, even the custom rats, even the smallest, most basic rat, can find a file and upload it back to the command and control server. And they can do that over their own channel, and generally that works pretty well for small bits of data. But if it's really big, if you've just zipped up a gigabyte of data, 10 gigabytes of data, passing that over your malware command and control channel is a really, really good way to say, hey, look at me. I'm making a lot of traffic to this one server, which you should never actually see. So if it's really, really big, you got another option. You could try FTP. FTP works really well for transferring large files, and in some networks, FTP is used a lot for transferring data in and out. But that's not true of all networks. So ideally, Bob has done some recon in your network to try and get an understanding of whether that is, not, that is normal. Because if a large FTP outbound transfer is gonna look abnormal, then he's not gonna wanna use it. His next opportunity is going to the cloud. Because there's a lot of data in a lot of our networks that is going out to the cloud. Um, to Box, Dropbox, any sort of location. If the attacker is able to upload a file to that location, it's gonna be SSL encrypted, most likely. It might not be well controlled because a lot of users need access to it as well. And even a gigabyte of data might blend in with a whole bunch of other files, especially in a very large network. 
The biggest downside with using the cloud is that's not your, that's not Bob's host. That is a host that's out there in the cloud. And he might get detected. Uh, the people who are running that cloud provider might be able to shut it down. And they might also have a better opportunity at that point to try and trace the actual attack back to him. So we've walked through the entire kill chain at this point, the entire attack lifecycle. So what I want to talk about next is how do you win? And hopefully you guys have been thinking about this as I've been talking. In your network, how would I have done what Bob is doing? And how are my controls in place to actually prevent Bob from being successful? But I want to end with a few sort of items that I think will be helpful in you thinking about this. Don't be the low-hanging fruit. This is really important. Patch CVE 2010-3333, please. N0158, they both really need it. Force attackers to use their best tools. If you can easily be compromised just by straight up phishing or by someone using old vulnerabilities that they've exploited and using old malware that hasn't been you know, uh, well protected uh, to evade detection, then you're not doing your job well enough. You need to make them work hard. It's important for us to make sure that their jobs are harder and more expensive. Otherwise, you basically become a very easy target. I group all this together as well with basic cyber hygiene. And this term cyber hygiene is sort of amorphous at this point. But patching systems is part of good cyber hygiene. Having good passwords is part of good cyber hygiene. Educating users about the dangers of phishing, good cyber hygiene. And hopefully at some point, two-factor authentication will just be common good cyber hygiene because it's really, really helpful against attackers who are trying to, who've stolen credentials. Next category, know your network. If you can't see what's going on in your network, then you really can't defend that network very well. If you don't have visibility into all the access points where data, where potential attacks are coming in, then there's no way for you to prevent those attacks from being successful or detect them after the fact. That's especially true inside your network. If an attacker has made their way inside, they've gotten through those specific phases of the, the attack lifecycle and they're there, if you typically are using just these admins are allowed to RDP between hosts, you should know if other people are suddenly using RDP to access other systems. Or if you're monitoring certain kinds of traffic for other possible lateral movement um, inside the network and something stands out, you at least need to have the ability to see that. If there's nothing that's actually logging any of that traffic, nothing logging traffic from the host either, nothing capturing this information and people looking at it, then you really don't know your network. You're not gonna be able to have the visibility that you need to understand it. And in the same line, know where your valuable data is. So, like I said, there's a human on the other side of this attack and he has a motivation and a purpose for what he's doing. And he may be you know, financially motivated. He might be trying to capture your company's credit card numbers, or maybe you have a whole bunch of credit card numbers, and he wants to get them from all of your customers as well. That might be the goal. But you know your company better than anybody else. You know what's valuable inside your company. You might be able to think, if I was a bad guy, what would I try to steal from me? And if you do that, that helps you sort of isolate the areas of your network which are gonna be most vulnerable, and the data which is most vulnerable. Because we don't talk about network breaches. Some people talk about network breaches. We don't publicly talk about network breaches. We talk about data breaches. Because attackers are looking for data, and that's really what's going to result in you having a really bad weekend. Last category, know your attacker. And this sort of follow, I purposely not know your enemy. Know your attacker, <laughs> know the attacker. This sort of follows on to the last one of knowing what your data is as well. Because if you think about who can benefit most from compromising you, and that's really specific to your industry and potentially just to your organization, that'll help you sort of make those same determinations about what's my important data, where do I need to protect it. And the last thing, like I said from the beginning, how would you attack your own network? I really think it's an important exercise for people to think about. Red teaming is great when you have a team who is focused on doing that, but most organizations, many organizations, can't afford to do that kind of activity on a regular basis. But you, as a security administrator, someone who's running a firewall or running other security technology, can at least consider that. What, how and why would someone attack me or my network, and how would I do that? What would I go for if I were a bad guy? How would I do it? So I want you to think about that sort of continuously. All right, that is my last slide. One thing that I want to leave you guys with is Unit 42, my team, we have produced in the last 12 months 96 reports about new attacks, all of them public on the blog that's listed here at the bottom. Um, 
Some of them have information that might be relevant to you. They're about cybercrime gangs, espionage, new attacks, new ransomware, new exploit kits. Everything that we are identifying that we think is important, we try to push it out so that everyone can be aware of that. So I certainly ask all of you to check the blog out. It's Unit 42, I don't know why that line wrapped on me. I'm gonna blame marketing for that one too, just like the TM. Um, but check it out. If you Google Unit 42 blog, we're the whole page, so you don't actually have to know this URL. This is a lot easier. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, please, you can reach out to me directly if you want to, or you can go to the blog and sort of find what we're talking about. And then, questions. Any questions? Yeah. I don't know if we have mic. Their mic's coming. Do you have any uh, listing of your decoy files you found? Like a big listing of all of them? Yeah. Not that we've shared anywhere, but that is something that we could make more available. If you're interested in a specific attack that we've looked at, where we've listed some of them, we can definitely get you a list of all the decoys in that case. A lot of the ones that we've ended up writing, uh, two pa Rob's gonna talk in like, an hour and a half about this attack called Scarlet Mimic, and I won't ruin anything related to that. I don't think he's gonna talk a lot about decoys. That one was all attacks against um, Uyghur and Tibetan activists um, in China, and in those cases, those decoys were all primarily written in Uyghur, some in Turkish as well, some in English, but that was very specific to those organizations. Same with these cases where we're looking at the, uh, the ones related to the uh, Lotus Blossom was all attacking Southeast Asian governments, um, so in that case, might not be relevant to you. You might be in the Philippines Navy. I'm not completely sure. I won't judge. But yeah, that's interesting. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Are you seeing uh, remote access technologies using uh, IPv6 transition technologies to report back? So we haven't, I haven't observed that in any malware specifically, but in a lot of cases, the IPv4 v6 transition um, happens at the network layer and the malware doesn't have to care about it. So whatever host that it's on, Instead of it picking an IP, it's gonna do a DNS query to say, we haven't seen any command and control servers hosted on IPv6, that's what I'll say. At least I haven't observed any. So if the network needs to transit over an IPv6 network, the network generally is gonna take care of that the same way if a browser needed to go and visit a certain domain, that sort of connection happens for it. So I would expect that it has happened, it is transiting, but it's not something we've, we've observed, at least from a hosting perspective. Yeah. Hi. I've uh, got two questions. First of all, regarding attribution, right? Uh, at the end of cyber kill chain, you said that you should know your attacker. Of course, definitely you should know that. But attribution is really very, uh, I mean, in, in my view, it's very bit difficult and could be political, you know? Sure. Because you cannot come very instantly. So what do you think, I mean, of how you guys do, do, do that? Um, uh, and second question is that um, a part of uh, the, what offensive security plays in that, in that whole cyber kill chain role? Can, can you say that one more time? Deploy that the offensive security, the, the, the offensive measures. Oh, sure. How can we deploy that? I mean, the organizations, for example, can we go for that strategy as well or not? Attribution first. Um, attribution is a big question, which I get to talk about a lot, which is fun. Um, there's lots of types of attribution. Generally, Palo Alto, we're not law enforcement, so we're not normally trying to attribute attacks to a single human or even to a government necessarily. What we are trying to do is understand the group who launched the attack. So when we write about Scarlet Mimic, our goal in that wasn't to say, this is this country's government that was launching this attack. But what we wanna do is describe the attacks, all the malware that was being deployed, all the tools that are deployed, all the command and control infrastructure, define how we have linked those together, and then draw a circle around that and say, that's Scarlet Mimic. And the reason we think that's useful is, when I share that with you, if you are also a target of one of those attacks in the future, based off all those linkages that we have, or you work in an industry that's targeted by the same group, or an organization which is targeted by the same group, that information is useful to you in saying, this group, no matter who it is, is interested in attacking me. So when we're talking about attribution, generally we're not trying to get to that level. And even if we were to get to that level, it's not useful for us necessarily to publish that publicly because it doesn't help the people who are reading it defend their networks better. It might in some cases, but it's much more helpful to law enforcement to be able to go and take those action, and we'd share that with them privately. On what should a offensive security person do with the kill chain? Uh, so if you're part of a red team or something, um, and you're generally trying to attack your network over and over, I think it is, 
you probably understand the process of attacking an organization very, very well. You may want to look at reporting like ours and how we have formed things in the kill chain to say, how does that particular adversary launch this kind of attack? Because you might be able to replicate it. That's certainly an option. You can look at this attacker's playbook and say, let's replicate that playbook. We'll do it the same. We'll use the same tools. We'll use the same techniques and see how our network would have defended against that. I think that's definitely worthwhile. The biggest challenge is um, being able to replicate the entire playbook. It's hard to know everything that happened inside it, unless you're a company who has attacked specifically with it and you've got really, really good data. Um, but I definitely think it's worth trying to repeat those things. Any other questions? Right back there, right behind you. Thank you. Uh, so given with the answer you just gave to that fellow, um, are you guys still seeing Operation Cleaver traffic or? or a, an iteration of it? I don't know if we've actually seen any updates on Operation Cleaver recently. I'd have to check. Okay. We should check autofocus. <laughs> any other questions? There's really bright lights, so I can't see you that well. I can see over here, great. That's great. No questions over there. Over here is fuzzy. All right, I think that's about it. Thanks, everyone, for coming out.